Greetings sailors and welcome to Patreon Supporter Spotlight number 72. This is going to be quite a long one, it's three replays, but it also feels quite long for me because it's taken a really long time to do this video. My brain has just not really been cooperating this week as with the previous weeks. I'm still trying out this, uh, this first lot of antidepressants and... I've got my mornings back at least, but um, I'm not necessarily feeling much better throughout the day and it's really hard to concentrate on even sitting and talking for 10 minutes straight about a particular thing when you just are feeling horribly overtired all the time. But I'm feeling like today might be my lucky day for actually getting at least this part of this video finished. So we're going to kick this one off with Pirate Skenya here in the Eigler, the tier 6 premium French destroyer. He's in a bit of a French division actually. Toby Jug, who is his division mate, is in the Normandy. And fortunately for both of them, there aren't any carriers around because the Normandy has terrible AA and, well, this thing's a destroyer. Most destroyers don't have particularly good AA either. And especially with uh, post uh, 8.0, um, carriers are a real pain if you're in destroyers. But I think all of these replays are from patch 7.12, so that doesn't really pertain. You'll note, by the way, that's a Miyoko. This is technically a tier 7 game, but there was only one tier 7 ship per team. So if we can knock out that Miyoko, which he's managed to nearly do just with the torpedoes alone, it will be quite useful for his team. They did take a bit of a risk in coming here, though. Apart from the two of them, there was also a single Omaha, and the entire rest of the team all sailed south. And it was a risky move before they even knew where the enemy team was, but now they know that the enemy team has done pretty much the opposite thing. It's even more risky. Although at least they're not all shooting at him. Some of them are shooting at Toby Jug as well, and Pirate Skenya at least is able to get unspotted. This isn't the most stealthy destroyer by any stretch of the imagination, but the enemy team actually has, uh, I think, at least one Igler. Uh, one of their destroyers, uh, no, it's two destroyers per team, so one of the enemy team's destroyers is an Igla, and I can't remember offhand what the other one is. And their own team, their other destroyer is also an Igla, so there were lots and lots of Iglas in play in this particular game, and I'm not entirely sure why, just coincidence, probably. So they're now doing the sensible thing and retreating, but you can see Piritskenya weighing up the the benefit of opening fire, of breaking stealth, and uh, given that the enemy Igler is there and spotted, he decides to do so. Of course, the guns on this are very powerful. They are 139mm guns, which is practically light cruiser-sized in terms of uh, the, the actual uh, calibre. But the placement of them is a little bit awkward, so if you want to fire all of them, you have to show quite a lot of broadside. Piritskenia is also here having a problem with an island jumping out at him, which does happen to the best of us at times. But in this case, it's not too bad because although he was spotted at the point where he beached himself, whoever was spotting him wasn't actually then close enough to continue spotting him once that detection radius shrank. Toby Jug is probably having no such luck, though. Even with Concealment Expert, he's still going to be well within the spotting radius of enemy ships, so uh, I'm sure he's going to end this with uh, quite a high amount of potential damage, although Pirate Skenya himself I think also has a pretty decent amount of potential for being in a destroyer. His team meanwhile are now, well they've taken the middle and they're now starting to push up from the south. And they're actually pushing up the center, they're not just going all around the outside, which is what the enemy team are doing. And what I think has happened here is that the enemy team has become fixated on these two players and forgotten that there are, are objectives that they need to play for in order to win the game. And so although they are at the moment behind on points, that situation is not going to last too long, not when they've got two cap points. Things are getting a bit hairy at the moment though, that is a lot of ships trying to fire at Pirate Skenya at the moment, and so he decides to pop his 
second smokescreen of the match. The first one, I'm not entirely convinced it was great timing because it enabled him to get the cap, but then he didn't have it at the point where he was running away. And it wasn't really that important that they get the C cap in the scheme of things. And that's my phone going in the background, just ignore that. I may have forgotten to turn that off, but uh, anyway. So, yeah, that maybe could have been a bit better in terms of timing. And then again, with this smoke screen, he doesn't really get a chance to sit and fire in a way that I think he was hoping to. I think he was hoping to have killed that enemy Igler and removed the threat of torpedoes. But when the Igler went unspotted before he could get the, the final blow he was a force to abandon that idea so you could see maybe the thinking there and it just didn't pan out rather than it being mistimed I mean you could say it's mistimed in retrospect but uh, it was the sensible thing to do not to hang around in a big torpedo target talking of torpedo targets that was a very nice time to get a detonation that was what 34,000 hit points in one go that alone has bumped his uh, his his uh, damage up by a fair old chunk, but he was already doing pretty well. This is going to turn out to be, I think, a pretty impressive result in the Igler, given that it is not the stealthiest of uh, ships. It can at least do uh, uh, stealth drops, and it does get uh, uh, smoke screens to work with that you can then use those high caliber guns with but this one hasn't really been one of those kind of games where you sit and pummel broadside cruisers with the 139 mil guns now you might be wondering why on earth has he opened fire at this point when he absolutely didn't have to when he's on such low health and I would guess at this point that it's just pure distraction. I mean, they are absolutely wailing on Toby Jug, and so I think partly it is to take some of the heat off his division mates. And it's a risky thing to do. He might die in the process. But also, I think he's pegged at this point that, I mean, how could he not? That the enemy team are chasing them. They're no longer playing for the cap circles. They're not even trying to go for the, a, uh, the, the B cap. And if they were, they've left it far too late because now his allies are actually pushing towards C. They are in danger of losing the only cap that they still have. So he's fully embraced the role of being a distraction, of trying to pull enemy ships away from the objectives. And it's about this kind of stage that he decides he's going to use his last smoke screen because there are a couple of things still in range and things sailing into range and he now has plenty of ships to spot for him and there's also nothing he has to worry about in terms of dropping torpedoes into his uh, into his smoke and he initially tries for the emerald and i wasn't quite sure why he was picking on the emerald but i guess i, I mean it's not the most dangerous ship in this matchmaking <laughs> Not by a margin, but because they're lower health, I mean, if he gets the kill, then it, of course, bumps up their points uh, even closer towards uh, that thousand needed for victory. So that was probably the reason for it, or it could have just been he thought it would be an easy kill. But as they've backed into their own smoke, he's forced to pick on something uh, a bit meatier, and in this case, it's a Bayern who made the fatal mistake of extinguishing one fire and so that leaves them open for getting multiple subsequent fires set on them and so this is of course going to help Piritskenia's damage go even higher and he's actually going to just towards the end of his smoke going out I mean he's got one fire going somebody else has got on another fire going so that's two fires on this Bayern and this Bayern does not have fire prevention but with one of his final salvos as this, this uh, time runs down he's going to get not one but two he's going to get another two fires so this Bayern is quite thoroughly screwed this is why you do not just extinguish the 
first fire that hits you because this can happen and you will regret it. He is now close enough to get spotted on the surface though and uh, he knows he's almost certainly doomed so I think he's making a play here just to try and get as close as he can to drop on this, uh, what is that, Queen Elizabeth? I can't quite see, the, the preview is just fuzzy enough. No, it's an Eitel Friedrich, there we go. Uh, so, yeah, he knows that even if the uh, the, the main battery doesn't get in, that the secondaries are going to be a threat in their own right. Although not as much a threat as they would be on a, a tier 7 battleship. Because uh, you can vastly increase the, uh, the uh, efficiency of your secondaries, of course. If this was a Shan horse to say, he'd probably have uh, died a bit quicker. But as it is... He does die and it's to the main battery, but it doesn't really matter because they've won and he's walked away with almost 150,000 damage, which is not half bad. I mean, a 30 odd K of that was from a detonation, which is pure RNG, but even if you subtracted that detonation, he was still hitting that other Eitel Friedrich with torpedoes. He still would have gotten some damage out of it. So. Here's the closing seconds of this game and a rather charming replay bug that has been in since, um, oh, is it 07.11 or is it just since 07.12? I don't know, but if you are watching somebody else when you're dead or if you are using a spotter plane, as we will see actually in the next replay, or if you're following in a shell or a torpedo, it looks pretty horrible in uh, in uh, uh, replays, unfortunately. So there's the the scores. He did very well with torps, ninety three thousand damage. It really was more about the torps than anything else. But uh, he still uh, had a, a nice top up from uh, not just the main battery, but also fires particularly as well. I don't think he uh, had a, a huge amount of flooding damage there. I didn't really particularly notice that. But then. My brain isn't possibly working as best as it could at the moment for reasons I have already stated. So on to our next game. This is Amarama in the Musashi. And again, fortunately for him, no carriers because the Musashi was and I think probably still is very easy prey for carriers, although maybe not quite as vulnerable given the mechanics these days, but given that we've already had two hotfix patches for 8.0, uh, things are a little bit in flux at the moment. But regardless, no carriers is a good thing for him indeed. He's also packing the Yamamoto Captain, although we don't get to see the special abilities come into play in this one. It's... Uh, is it a Kraken you need? He comes close to getting a Kraken, but uh, by the time he'd gotten the Kraken, it probably wouldn't have been that much use to him. Although you do get some hit points back, don't you, when the uh, the ability kicks in. So it, it, he might have ended with a bit more health than he's going to. But I don't think it would have affected the overall outcome of the game. Now when he sent this to me, he reckoned that it would be a really good one to close a, a, an a episode, a, a video with. I'm struggling for words today. And ordinarily, I absolutely would have used this one at the end of a video because it's a really, really good game. And it's a personal best for him in a way that we will see, that will become apparent over the, over the course of this video. But then there was another replay I looked at, the third and final one, which is in many ways not nearly as impressive but I think was just too entertaining to not use as the the highlights as the as the final uh, uh, bit of entertainment for the video. So uh, yes, that is yet to come. That that is it's another Japanese ship, but it's maybe not one that I've actually showed before. And uh, it, it's certainly a result that I haven't quite seen before. But we'll come to that. I'm getting ahead of myself. So this is a standard game, and it's this map, which I cannot quite remember the name of right at this moment, but it's not particularly a favourite of mine. I do prefer it in domination mode, but 
even when not in domination mode, or in, even when it is in domination mode, it's not that fun to play, personally. Maybe there are people out there that like this map. But uh, yeah, it, it's very... It, like you might get one team that does like his team's doing and trying to play very defensively, which can sort of work and sort of not. Quite often it's like neighbours or two brothers and you get a kind of carousel effect going on. And then it becomes a, a race back through the middle to, to decap. But uh, as it is, what we're going to see is just a steady rate of attrition between the two teams and then we're going to get to a stage where people are going to be trying to cap and then other people are going to be going back to try and defend the cap and it really is going to be quite close all the way down the line. You can see here quite readily by the way that replay bug where it's only when you're using a spotter plane, the normal artillery view is fine, uh, it, it becomes incredibly janky the actual frame rate counter stays steady, but it looks like it's running at like 20 FPS. It's unpleasantly juddery. There's nothing I can do about it, I'm afraid. It is just a bug with replays, as of at least the last patch, if not the current patch as well. So at the moment, just long range fire, trying to um, keep his eyes ahead of him alive at Yugumo because there are enemy destroyers he has to worry about. We know the Kitakaze is definitely on the other side and that Kitakaze will be a threat. At least uh, not directly to him but certainly to his team. That Kitakaze will um, certainly uh, be playing reasonably well but um, there is a destroyer on this side he has to be a bit wary of though and it's a Benson so he can at least be assured that the Yugumo can outspot the Benson but the Yugumo then has the problem of that's a Cleveland and so they can't get too close to that. So it really is in his best interests to help this Yugumo stay alive and the Yugumo isn't they're not doing anything too crazy they're not taking any particularly massive chances because if they did this would be a rather overextended position. I don't think he'd be here if the Yugumo wasn't also here. He's not totally alone though, there is another battleship steaming this way as well. And so although he's taking a bit of attention right now and although that Massachusetts is getting a bit uncomfortably close in terms of uh, their secondary batteries being able to set fires. Uh, just a little warning tootle there so they don't run into each other. Um, he's, he's being a bit cagey, he's keeping his distance and the fact that this Iowa is now here as well means that they'll be taking some of the heat. It won't just be uh, uh, armor armor because if he were to stick around, I mean, yes, these guns are nasty. He's already managed to do some hefty chunks of damage to some of these enemy ships. But just by sheer weight of fire, they would wear him down eventually. This Massachusetts, though, has made the mistake of just going for it. And they have paid the price, and it's actually Armor Armor that gets the kill. Although I don't think he got the lion's share of the damage. His damage has been a bit spread out between the Massachusetts and the two cruisers. I think the only thing he hasn't shot at on this side so far has been that Benson. So back to firing at the cruisers and the Cleveland is uh, probably the uh, the choicier target or the more dangerous target because just the, the rate of fire means they're much more able to set fires than the Rune. Although the Rune is not to be discounted. The Rune can also be a dangerous ship. But just in terms of not getting your face melted off by fire, yeah, the Cleveland is the one to take out first. He was misjudging his shots a little bit there though, but trying to nail somebody who is actively dodging and uh, 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 turning in a, a, a ship as maneuverable as a cruiser can be a bit tricky sometimes. It's at this point that that Benson pops up, because there Yugumo had backed off to the point where the Benson felt able to uh, make more of a play, but they got themselves spotted. And unfortunately for them, Amarama's gunners were really on point. He managed to get a full penetration 
and a whole bunch of overpens for just over 10k damage, so most of that Benson's hit points. I bet they're really regretting getting spotted now. The Ugumo even broke cover to uh, open fire themselves to try and get that final shot. And although Amarama has rather awkwardly beached himself during this whole process, the manoeuvring he was doing was enough to ensure that those torpedoes missed. So, with the rune dead, thanks to the Iowa, and the Benson dead, it really is just that wounded Cleveland left, and Amarama is free to now move forwards a bit. Of course, while this has all been going on, that war of attrition has been happening, and his team's actually been coming off a bit worse. Because, of course, now they outnumber the enemy team on this flank, but that means the enemy team outnumbers their team on the other flank. And the ships that are there, well, some of them aren't looking too healthy. That Friedrich de Grosse in particular is uh, fairly mortally wounded at this point. They're not going to last too much longer. The Iowa has turned back to help. They're fairly healthy. And they've also got a rune who, I'm not sure what level of health they have, but they are backing off just as much as they can, just as fast as they can to uh, try and survive because they don't want to take on all of those ships by themselves. And that Kitakaze, by the way, who is the surviving enemy destroyer, well, they've got themselves two kills out of that scrum that was up in that corner. And as you can see from some of the enemy ships, they're also looking very healthy. In fact, there's some nearly full health battleships still around up there. So, in terms of placement of, of forces, their cap is looking quite vulnerable at the moment, but so is the enemy cap, and thus begins the phase of battle where we see how many of those enemy ships turn back to defend their own cap. We've already got an Izumo who has pushed down through the middle to get close to their cap and is now actually turning down into their cap and that will undoubtedly draw some enemy ships back. But which enemy ships and how many of them? Well, we don't quite know that at the moment. The Kitakaze alone could be a serious problem, but they do have the Yugumo left alive to at least provide some spotting. In a one-on-one -on -one fight versus each other though, the Yugumo versus Kitakaze, in terms of their guns and their, their respective spotting ranges, you wouldn't want to get into that fight too often in Yugumo, although as we are just seeing, the enemy Kitakaze is at least low health, so that does even things out rather considerably. So, Amorama is taking advantage of all of these side shots to uh, try and get some more damage done. He's nearing 100,000 already, and in fact he's now even closer. And uh, although he doesn't have much of a chance of citadeling that De Grossa, he still might be able to inflict some significant damage. But he's also got to be wary himself of getting into any kind of close quarters fight if he is in a position where his citadel is exposed, which with the Masashi, uh, even over and above the exposure that you have in the Yamato is uh, is fairly dangerous just because it, it sits higher in the water. It is that much easier to do very bad things to the Citadel unless you are exactly bow on. Even a little bit of angling can get you into serious trouble. And so when this Iowa, this full health Iowa, is spotted coming back round, well, not only is it an opportunity, but it is also a threat. He has to point his nose at this guy ASAP. There's also the enemy Musashi in play, but fortunately for him, they are both right now concentrated on decapping. So this is a perfect opportunity to get in some more damage to seriously wound these enemy ships. So the temptation must be there to angle and use his third turret. But for now he's being sensible, he's pointing his ship towards them, he's slowed right down and he's just ripping huge chunks out of this Iowa. I think he could be maybe leading a little better in terms of trying to hit the Citadel though, but even without those Citadel shots, even with just the full penetrations, that Iowa is now starting to look really quite badly wounded, 
and this is tempting enough that he does give in to the temptation and bring that third turret around because at the moment they are not focusing him. His shots on the Musashi, in terms of finding citadels, well, they fare a lot better and it just goes to show <laughs> why that angling is so important because it's not like they were quite flat broadside to him but it was more than broadside enough to nail that citadel hard and so that Musashi, they're in serious trouble. If Amarama doesn't manage to kill him and he doesn't quite, somebody else will surely do so. So he's turned this fight around this immediate fight quite favourably, but while all this has been going on, the Kitikaze is capping. So he has to A, trust the rune to actually take care of that, and B, be aware of the fact that there might well be torpedoes coming from the direction of his own cap. So while this has been going on, we have lost the Izumo, and uh, there was another ship there as well, and I forget what it was, but it is now just the Yugumo who is bailing out hard because, of course, the Buffalo has radar. But the Buffalo isn't charging in to engage. They've gotten themselves into a position to force that Yugumo out of the cap. But now they're more turning their attention towards Amarama. And while this has been going on, the rune has similarly forced the Kitakaze out of the cap, so we've got to be wary of that as well. They might well be coming for Amarama. And so with the Iowa retreating temporarily out of view, he is trying to hit the buffalo and he's got his spotter up once again. I'm guessing because of the potential threat from the Kitakaze. It, it's, you know, the poor man's radar slash uh, hydro. It, it may or may not give you advanced warning of torps, but if it does, then uh, it might well save your life, especially considering these are going to be Japanese torps. These will hurt. The Buffalo, meanwhile, is absolutely taking a chance by uh, giving him this kind of broadside, but uh, maybe they're running Hydro because they managed to completely dodge those Yugumo Torps, so it might have been more that they pulled broadside relative to him to dodge the Torps rather than they were being that silly. And I suspect that's the case because they're angling right back in. Although against these guns it doesn't really matter. So there's the Torps, long expected and finally arriving. Fortunately those are all going well behind him. He's also been acutely aware of the fact that the Iowa is still very much alive and kicking and nearby and has positioned himself so that he's dead bow on, which is fine. The Iowa actually comes around the corner firing HE. And again, although that was a decent number of pens, I think he could have aimed for Citadel shots a bit better considering quite how close and how broadside this Iowa is, but given the state of the game, given how close this is on points and ships, and given that we're really getting quite close on time, I would personally forgive Armorama at this point for uh, maybe feeling the adrenaline a little bit, because this is it. This is the, the last couple of minutes of the game where it's do or die. And he's making the incredibly risky play of bringing his third turret round and banking on getting the killing blow before the Iowa has a chance to fire back and potentially kill him. And it pays off, quite fortunately, because at that angle the Iowa easily could have ended him with AP shells. There is still this buffalo to deal with though, and he's all out of heels. The Kitakaze could also, at this stage, make themselves a real problem, but I think they've bailed out of this middle area, to be honest. The rune is now coming south, and so if the Kitakaze was in between the two of them, um, it's not looking good for the enemy team right now. The fact that he's been able to kill that Iowa, and that was the crucial moment, means that with those uh, nasty bow penetrations he got on the buffalo and the eventual... Uh, death by secondaries, uh, yeah, they've easily, 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 he says, won this. Well, no, there was nothing easy about it. This one was uh, quite 
tense and close all down the line. And the personal best in this one is unsurprisingly the damage done, just shy of 300,000 damage. I think that's more than I've ever managed. That's also almost enough to give him 3,000 base XP. And uh, as you can see, the rune did quite well in that one as well. The Yugamo, not so much, but they were maybe a bit stymied by radar. On the other hand, maybe arguably they could have been positioned more usefully towards the end of that game in terms of rooting out the enemy Kitakaze. But regardless, once he killed that Iowa, that really clinched the deal. That was the winning blow. But he took a heck of a risk to do it. It's just fortunate that it paid off. So what could possibly top a game like that? Well, I present my first Yumikaze game. I don't think I've ever featured a replay. This is Wolf of Camp Scalpel. I think I'll just be sticking to Wolf, who is a fairly recent Patreon supporter, I, I think. No, yes, I think he is. And this is a Tier 2 Japanese destroyer. Now, seal clubbing ain't quite what it used to be, because in warships these days, there is basically a separate matchmaking queue for the very new players and everybody else once you've hit over a certain level of battles if you are taking out these low tier ships you're going to get into a game with not that many players because you're playing against the other more experienced players who are also in the low tier ships so chances are good that the people he's playing against at least know the basics of how the game works this is also i should point out the A-Hull ship. And that's quite deliberate because the A-Hull Umikaze has five secondary guns and he's actually got various uh, flags and skills that buff the range of those secondary guns, although he doesn't have AFT because he pointed out it's not even that seal clubby because he's got a nine-point captain as though that makes it better. But as I've said, it really isn't what it used to be. So, 5 kilometer torpedoes, a very quick reload, but the upgraded torps, I think, are actually just straight up better. They're like 4 knots faster. I think the reload is maybe very slightly longer. Uh, there's basically no reason not to upgrade, unless you're doing this. Unless you're doing it for the secondary gun memes, which <laughs> Wolf clearly is. And even though he was easily uh, spotted dropping these because the, uh, the torp range is less than his surface spotting, he managed to still strike that, uh, that, what is that? That cruiser, again, the preview is just slightly too fuzzy. Novik, there we go. To uh, actually take most of their health. It's going to have to be careful of the enemy team's destroyers, though, because uh, at least one of them, there we go, is a V-25. The V-25 is a very popular low-tier ship because of those forward mounted single torpedo tubes and uh, if you see people dying early on to a v25 it's probably because they got on the wrong end of a torpedo joust for want of a better word the guns on this ship by the way i mean japanese destroy guns tend to be reasonably good in terms of damage done but uh, lacking in the reload and turret traverse and this ship definitely exemplifies those qualities. It has two guns, which both have a very long reload and not a particularly quick gun traverse. So you really are relying more on the torpedoes. Although, once you get the upgraded ones, which I think have like an eight kilometer range, I mean, they're still quite slow, but an eight kilometer torp range with a 20 odd second reload, that's quite dangerous. Even with the separated matchmaking queues there are still more than enough people playing their tier 3 battleships uh, badly enough you know just driving in straight lines to make that uh, uh, quite an attractive proposition but in this case he's well he's going to get some more torpedo hits but there aren't really any battleships it's just cruisers and destroyers and because of the low number of ships well we're already rapidly running out of players on both teams. Half of his team is dead already, or just about half, and the enemy team has lost a pair of ships as well. 
these low tier maps are also quite small. You don't really get a sense of scale just looking at the mini map. It's and especially when you've adjusted to playing the higher tier maps. And you look at the mini map and then you look at where enemy ships are and you're like, okay, there's there's some kind of sense of of um uh oh what's the word I'm looking for? Nope, my brain's not cooperating uh, at all right now, but um, yeah, th there is a, a kind of a sense of scale that you get that then just goes completely out of whack at these low tiers because the maps are just that much smaller, but you don't really get a sense of that just from the minimap alone. So even though the uh, the stealth without any kind of camo, without concealment expert, which you won't be able to have because it's only a 9-point captain, it, it's still 5 point something kilometres. The engagements are taking place at such close ranges that uh, that doesn't really even matter that much. It, there's, there's not really that sense where you get in the high tiers of uh, slow, patient, stalking manoeuvres that you can sometimes manage to pull off in the, uh, the stealthier torpedo-dropping destroyers. It just doesn't apply. So I've sped this bit up because he's in their cap. They're in his team's cap. There's two of them left. Four of the enemy team left. And there now flows a period of him just sailing around in the cap. And I was watching this thinking, is this it? Is he just going to cap out? Because in the email and on the score screens, I, I was promised a solo warrior. And you can do that. If you cap against that many people, then uh, if you you know survive and win the game via capping against uh, is one versus four, then uh, yeah, it is, isn't it? Yes. Uh, then, yeah, that's a solo warrior. And I was thinking, okay, you know, that's nice enough, tier two solo warrior game, but I don't think I'll be using this. But no, that's not what happens at all. Not at all. So I initially thought he was going to pull into the gap between the islands so he could bail out quickly, if need be, but instead he's kind of tucked himself in so he's got a bit of cover, but... I don't think it was that well thought out a strategy because this Dresden is now just steaming towards him and that thing has got a lot of quite fast firing, uh, it's going to be like 4 inch guns, it'll be 100 mil or 102 mil or something around that. This is potentially game ending right here, he is the last ship alive, 1 versus 4 and now we've gone from me thinking is this just going to be him capping out? Wow, that's not really going to be a very interesting replay. How do, how do I, you know, express this tactfully to how the heck is he going to pull this off? Because this Dresden, clearly anticipating he's going to drop torps, it's not going to be enough. But even though the Dresden does die, they've managed to nail most of his health. And he's still got another cruiser and two destroyers to deal with, one of which is a Samson the tier 2 American cruiser, which has considerably faster firing guns. And there's still the V-25, so how in the ever-living heck is he going to get away with this? Well, a big part of the reason why this ends up being a solo warrior game is about to come up because the two destroyers both charge in, seeing him wounded and they manage to land some hits, they bring him down to 74 health and then both proceed to die to his torpedoes. So that was high caliber, two devastating strikes and a double strike all in the same instant. And now it's one versus one. And we're not even done yet because the enemy remaining cruiser, a Chikuma, is capping. And he's capping, but he got reset. They have more points. All the enemy team has to do is sit tight. All this Jakuma has to do is sit tight. And they've won. And so Wolf is left with a choice of does he accept this fate? Or does he try and do something about it? On 74 hit points, it's looking like a pretty tall order. Especially given that he's only got these two puny little guns and... If he's going to get close enough to torp the Chikuma, the Chikuma is going to know about it. The Chikuma is going to see him. Now, as the Chikuma is pulling in behind that island, he 
looses a few well-timed shots to try and see if he can get some decap flags. If he had managed to land a hit, then perhaps he could have capped this one out. But as it is, because he's only got those two guns, he wasn't able to land the hits. And unwilling to accept defeat, or at least to try and go out fighting, Wolf decides we're going to try and do something about this. So, pulls into view the Chikuma, who has themselves tucked in behind an island, actually takes a hit, and I can only assume that his superstructure has basically run out of hit points, because if you are unaware, you've got your main amount of hit points for your ship, but the ship is also divided into different compartments, if you like, which also have their own pool of hit points. And it is possible to run out of hit points on, say, the bow or the superstructure and therefore not be able to take any more damage in that particular area. If you see somebody surviving multiple torpedo hits to the, the nose of their ship, for example, when you think, okay, that surely should have killed them, and yet they survive, well, what's happened is the bow ran out of hit points, and so that amount of hit points that they should have taken could no longer be subtracted from their main health bar. And that's meant that he's survived the one hit that he took, which otherwise you'd think would have killed him. There is like three rivets holding this ship together right now. So now we have a standoff. He's blocking the Chikuma, and the Chikuma can easily kill him with a single shell that actually hits him somewhere where it can take away that final 74 hit points but equally one of his torps is going to be absolutely fatal to this Chikuma. His guns aren't going to do it but his torps most certainly will. The guns however travel faster than the torps so if it comes down to it the Chikuma will have the edge. And so now we have a bit of a staring contest across this island and we'll just have to see who breaks first. At the moment if we hit the uh, like if, if they just stay like this for the next six, six and a half minutes if we hit zero on the timer wolf wins because well actually no what am i talking about let's start over if we hit zero on the timer right now wolf would win because they were at more points but because his own team's cap circle is blocked and the enemy team's isn't they are slowly accumulating points and there we go they've just overtaken so, if we wait the next six minutes, this is how well my brain's working at the moment. If we wait the next six minutes, if this is it, the next six minutes of gameplay, the enemy team has won. Something's gotta give if this is somehow going to be a solo warrior. And I was absolutely on the edge of my seat the first time watching this. This Jakuma, and maybe they haven't realised that, that all they need to do is nothing and they've won. And instead they, they, well clearly they're getting a bit antsy. They've gone forward a little bit and they've baited the drop. And if this was a higher tier Japanese destroyer where you had to wait two minutes for the torps to reload, then okay, that would be a viable strategy. But when the reload is more along the lines of 20 seconds, it doesn't really work quite as well. But this is perhaps a sign that Jakuma isn't willing to just sit and wait. A wolf really needs them to make the move here. On 74 hit points, he could take the chance that another hit wouldn't end him. And try and go for the torpedo drop. But the RNG would very likely not be in his favour. Instead, as they are at the moment outside of that two kilometer auto spotting range, he pulls away from the island, the Chikuma spots him, and he's going to drop torps. But my initial reaction would have been to use smoke first, then drop torps. As it is, he does get away with it, the Chikuma's shells miss, and now he's broken contact again. At this point, it's all up in the air. There's open water between them, there is only the smoke that's blocking vision right now. When it was this standoff behind the island, it was in the Chikuma's favour. At this point, well, it really does depend on what the Chikuma's going to do. 
We don't know. Are they going to go back behind the island? Are they going to go back into the cap? I mean, he's gotten them to reset themselves, but they are still ahead on points. So even if he sails away, and we're now down to three and a half minutes, even if he just sails away and they never see each other again, the enemy team still wins. But that's not what is going to happen, because all this talk of a solo warrior tells you that surely Wolf is going to win this somehow. And at this point, we must logically assume that it's going to be with a torpedo hit, because these guns ain't going to do it. I'd love to say that this is a game that ends with him getting a close quarters, but no. So he gets spotted. There's a moment of real danger there, but fortunately, one of his torp drops, and he calculated that maybe they would come through the smoke cloud, and it paid off, and... One of the top drops actually hit him, and that was it. That was the clincher. That was what won the game. And that's how we got the solo warrior with 74 hit points. I very nearly sent this one to Jingles. It is absolutely in his wheelhouse, but in the end I decided to be completely selfish and keep it for myself because, wow, <laughs> that had it all. So that is the answer to the question, what could possibly top... A 300,000 damage nail-biter of a win in the Musashi. And it's an even more nail-biting win in the Umikaze, of all things. So well done, Wolf, for holding your nerve. You absolutely did the right things there, for the most part. And it turned into a most improbable victory. So that just about wraps up this video. I once again want to say thank you to all my Patreon supporters for being so patient and understanding. Um, I'm actually, for my next video, I have been contemplating doing something on carriers, but actually I think I'm going to do something a bit different and something that might require a bit less brain power because I can just sit down and record the thing and talk as I'm playing it, which is a bit easier at the moment. So uh, yeah, stay tuned for that. Hopefully that won't be too far away. In the meantime, if you've enjoyed this video, you can do all the usual things down underneath it. And of course, as always, stay tuned for more.